recording. So welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed the GIFs. Um, they were a little bit misaligned, unfortunately. Um, so why do you want to create a database in R? We'll have a slide about that, but in R you can use databases and it's a good idea to use databases in R sometimes. The R SQL Lite package is a limited version of SQL and it supports a limited amount of uh, of commands, so SQL commands, it doesn't support the full language, but the language support is good enough to be usable and uh, very handy sometimes in R. Um, so if you want to know all the supported commands, there's a there's a link um, where you can read the language definition. And if you want to use the package, then of course you have to install it first. Um, and you can use the install.packages command in R, and then you just have to specify that you want to install the R SQL Lite package. So um, the way that this works in R is in R you have to first create a database driver. Um, so this DB driver also provides a way not just to connect to an SQLite database, but you can also connect to other database sources like MySQL or Oracle or ProgressQL. And so the driver is kind of the um, connection object in R. So the, the Hey, you get a variable and using this variable um, you can then query the database. And so how do you create one of these connections? Well the package comes with the DB connect function and for example you connect you can connect directly to a data frame which you have loaded in R. And so if I do a read table and I read in uh, a table or a data frame in R and then I can use the uh, DB connect using the driver, um, hey, so I say driver is MySQLite or I say driver is uh, MySQL and hey, so you connect the driver to a data frame and then you get a connection and then on this connection to the database uh, you can uh, you can issue SQL queries, hey, which means that if you are very good in SQL, um, then of course this will help you a lot because then you don't have to write R and you don't have, well, you don't have to do for loops and these kinds of things to select your data or to make subsets. Hey, and you can use the SQL language directly. If you want to connect to an existing uh, SQLite database which is on your hard drive and then you can say DB connect um, use the driver SQLite or another driver say the DB name is system.file data and then the database name. So here, here I assume that you have a folder called data and in this folder called data you have your database file name and so you have to just specify that and then you get a connection and then this connection allows you to directly query through this database file. And so it, it, it has certain advantages and one of these advantages is that you can use the SQL language directly with R and so you can say well create a new table or create an object, insert into, select from, update in this database or delete from this database and of course there's a whole um, there's a whole bunch of things and a whole bunch of examples and so following this link hey, you get an overview of what you can do and how you can do this um, hey, but if if you if you know SQL then of course it's it's much easier to use SQL directly from R uh, than to uh, learn R extensively to do things like subsetting your data yeah, so what are the advantages? Well, if you know SQL, you avoid some of the complexities of R commands for selecting and merging different tables. Um, and one of the main advantages of doing that is that the memory management is much better. Um, when we were talking about R, I told you, or when we had the R lecture, I told you guys that everything in R is in your mem is in the, the memory of your computer. So if you have a, a, a table or a, a, a matrix, and this matrix has a thousand columns and five million rows, and then this, when you load this table into R, it will all be loaded into the R memory. So it will take up eight gigabytes or nine gigabytes of memory. And of course, if your PC doesn't have this amount of memory, then it will just fail with an out of memory error. But the nice thing about using this, um, this SQL package in R is that nothing gets loaded into memory everything just stays on your disk. So if your disk is like one terabyte big, then of course you can have a one terabyte um, um, one terabyte of data on your hard drive and you can use SQL to directly query from this massive table or from this massive database the stuff that you want. And 
there's no need for full data subsetting and you can select subsets of your data using SQL and then only the subset get transferred from the file into the R memory. Yeah, so the database driver is much smarter in handling the memory uh, or the random access memory availability um, than R is. Yeah, and also when you are querying multiple tables, hey, imagine that you have like five or six different tables which are all constrained using pri uh, using uh, foreign key constraints. And then of course when you merge these tables into one um, it is much faster to do that using the database driver because the database driver is written by very smart people um, which of course they, they optimize much more than what um, R can do. Because R is really there for being a general purpose language, while SQL is focused on performance, doing, doing queries as, as quick as possible and being allowed or being able to merge things together um, much easier. So there are many advantages of using uh, the R SQL like package in R. Um, one of them is memory management and the other one is uh, that you can merge tables very easily easily and quickly um, using the database driver which is optimized for these kinds of queries and optimized for these kinds of strategies. All right, so when you when you search a database, then of course, have based on which kind of database you are working with, you can have different ways of searching. So the standard way of searching is more or less like a Google search where you just input a search text and you get back things which match to your search text or are very close to that. Um, but of course, when you are looking at biological databases, then there are many different ways that you can search. And one of the ways that you might want to search is, for example, based on sequence. I might have a piece of DNA sequence and I might want to know um, in the database, give me all the sequences which are very similar to my DNA sequence that I have here. Um, hey, you can also search, some databases allow you to search motif based, hey, which means that you can kind of define a motif, say that at the first position um, there should be an A, um, but there can also be a C. At the second position, I require that there is a T always. At the third position, um, I don't really care, so it can be an A, a C, a T, or a G. And so a motif-based search allows you to kind of specify what kind of a, a, a sequence you want, and many motif searches allow you to search through the database using either, either a DNA motif or a protein motif. Um, some of the databases which are out there, which allow you to search through uh, proteins, also allow you to search on a structure based. Yeah? So it allows you to say, well, I want to have a protein uh, which has um, two uh, alpha helices followed by a beta sheet uh, followed by, for example, a, a, an amino acid which contains a cysteine and which can make cysteine links to other proteins. And so protein databases also often allow you to search based on, on primary or uh, based on primary and secondary protein structures. And so say, well, I give me uh, a, a protein and like I said, which has two alpha helices, a beta sheet, and then an amino acid, which codes for a cysteine bridge. One of the databases that we already saw is the database where you can uh, use mass spectrometry data. And the mass spectrometry databases, of course, are organized or, or are searchable using a mass-based system. So mass over charge. And you can say, well, I've measured this peak, and this peak is at 19.337 mass over charge units what is this? Yeah, of course, searching a database, do they provide a bulk data download and do they provide an API? And these are always questions that you have to keep in the back of your mind because of course hey, you don't want to go and have to click and type and click and type and, and download all the data and then put it in an Excel sheet while you are doing that because that is of course very error prone. Yeah, so using bulk data retrieval or using an API will will be much better because they don't really have an, uh, an, an, an error rate. While a human copy pasting things online, it will have a relatively high error rate. All right, so some important databases um, that are out there. Um, I just listed them here. Um, so um, one of the main databases that I think is very important for biology, um, but for biological research in general, so not just biology, but also things like medicine, is of course PubMed. So PubMed, I think everyone knows the database or should know the database. Um, and if you don't, then I would definitely 
force or not force you but advise you to look up PubMed. PubMed is the um, kind of entry point for scientific literature. So if you want to have literature, hey, you want to know what have people published about the BRCA2 gene um, in the last 10 years, then of course PubMed is your entry point and you can get an overview of scientific publications, peer-reviewed, um, which have been published in, in, in the last like 25 years um, and that, that's what's stored in PubMed. So uh, the EMBL Ensemble website um, stores DNA, um, we've already used it a lot of times, um, and it is, it is built up on DNA sequence. So uh, every animal has its own kind of reference DNA sequence, and all of the data in the Ensemble base is, is kind of linked to this DNA sequence. Um, a similar database is uh, GenBank, so GenBank is similar to Ensemble, it also is a DNA database and is also structured um, in, in that way. You have the DD, DDBG, um, which is another DNA database, and hey, all of these um, contain a lot of data which is overlapping, hey, so uh, the mouse genome sequence is in Ensemble, it's in, in GenBank, but it's also in the DDBG, um, but of course each of these databases have their own kind of specialty, their own reasons for why you want to use it, and they are kind of unique selling feature. Um, protein databases are also many, 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 um, so uh, the most important ones are Uniprot, uh, Tremble, uh, Peer and PDB, so PDB is more or less the oldest database on the on, on on the, well, not on the world, but the oldest biological database. Yeah. So um, Uniprot and Tremble are focusing more on DNA uh, or on, on protein structures, yeah, while the PDB is very focused on protein function, protein domains, um, and you have PEER, which is a very good protein database as well. So just a small overview. And then you have the NDB, which is focused on nucleic acids and uh, changes to nucleic acids. So it's an interesting database yeah, for when you are studying things like RNA or mRNA and modifications to this. Of course there are many 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 more interesting and important databases like ProSite, PayFam, and so these are um, protein family databases where there's links or protein, uh, they try to summarize proteins into um, uh, different um, they, they try to summarize proteins into different families, yeah, so based on um, features that they share. Um, you have the DSSP and the HSSP, which are databases for, for DNA and, and DNA motifs. Um, we have DBAST and DBSNP, those are variation databases where um, single nucleotide polymorphisms are stored and their um, relationship uh, within different populations. Yeah, so if you want to know like um, does this single nucleotide polymorphism occur more often in African Americans compared to Asians or Hispanics, yeah, then dbSNP can help you answer those questions. Um, CAG and Reactome, we already saw them in previous lectures, and these of course are databases which are structured um, in a way where you have uh, proteins or enzymes yeah, working on metabolites and creating these things together uh, or and, and, and holding these things together. But uh, we, we had a whole lecture about CAG and Reactome, so I think that most people are kind of familiar with it now. Um, you have the string database, um, which is um, for, I don't know, let me search that. StringDB. Ah, functional Protein Association Networks. So um, it's a database which contains um, around five to six thousand organisms and it contains around 25 million different known proteins um, and it has interactions between these proteins. So if you're interested in protein-protein interaction um, then you can use the StringDB. So if you want to know if this protein is um, in a protein complex together with other proteins you can use the string uh, StringDB. OMIM is the online Mendelian inheritance in men database. So OMIM contains all known Mendelian diseases um, and an overview of these. Um, I think we use the OMIM database. Um, if we didn't, then um, just let me know and then uh, we can get back to that. But if you're interested in Mendelian diseases and which genes are causing these in humans, then you can use OMIM. So OMIM is focused only on humans, then you have OMIA, and that is Mendelian diseases in animals, um, and 
it's the same database, more or less, same database structure, um, but it, it focuses on um, the um, on, on, on animals. So Mendelian diseases that are in animals that are also found in humans or not found in humans. And of course, hey, this is a very good database when you are interested in does my phenotype have a single gene causing it? If so, hey, then you can use these databases to get all the literature attached. Uh, not only that, but you can also get all the um, and you can also get the, the genes involved and their interaction partners and these kinds of things. Um, then there's the animal QTL database. We gave a, I gave a lecture about QTLs. Uh, of course, the animal QTL database is there for animals and plants. So it's, it's mostly, mostly focused on animals, but they also have like some model plants in there. And this is a database which stores all known associations um, that have been previously found. And so if you find that a certain region of the genome is controlling your phenotype, for example, the, uh, uh, the milk yield of a cow, and then you can use the animal QTL database to see if this same region has been uh, implicated in other breeds um, and you can use to you can use it to to see if there's other phenotypes like mastitis or uh, protein content in milk that are use that are that are mapping at the exact same position. Um, so, oh, I just just noticed that I have a new follower, um, Jungling. Thank you for following me um, and. Uh, Welcome to the stream as well. Um, so had the, the animal QTL database contains all QTL or more or less all known associations. Um, and of course they provide links to literature and they also provide things like how uh, significant was this association? Hey, when was it found? And these kinds of things. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice uh, animated GIF. Um, Jungling, just for you, if you wanna put your mood in the mood box uh, then you can use like uh, capitalized words and hey you can you can you can change your uh, you can change your your status like if you're angry or if you're confused and then it will update your your emoticon in in the mood box above me but uh, thanks for subscribing all right not subscribing but thanks for for the follow all right, so uh, just quickly run through some of these. I think most of you will know what, what PubMed is. Hey, PubMed contains scientific literature. Um, so you can search PubMed. PubMed has a very advanced searching system as well. Um, hey, so you can say, give me all the publications uh, written by Denny Arens um, in the last five years and sort them by the amount of citations that they have and these kinds of things. Um, so. NCBI, um, NCBI is generally the starting point of all biological knowledge and information. And so hey, it has built in tools like BLAST and clustering and automated data retrieval. Hey, it's very, very similar to uh, Ensemble. Hey, so Ensemble and NCBI, they are, they're, they're not the same database um, because there's different groups um, behind there um, that maintain the data, but they are very similar in what they do. So it's the DNA database and as a starting point, hey, if you if you go to NCBI, then you can see, well, it, it stores data on, on bioassays, uh, data and software. Hey, you can look at genes and the expression of genes. You can look at things like homology. So hey, does this protein occur in other in other species as well. Um, hey, you can do sequence analysis, you can look at variation, and of course all of these things are, are often link outs to other databases where the data is stored, hey, but they provide like this starting point. It's like the Google for um, biological data. Yeah, so the nice thing about the NCBI is that they have something called jQuery. Um, so if you if you don't know exactly what you are looking for, you can use jQuery. The link is here, uh, and it just allows you to do a free text search across like hundreds of different databases. So hey, if you if you want to know um, well what is known about um, the uh, PPR one gamma gene and then you can just fill in PPR1G and you'd click search and it searches like dozens and dozens of databases and just gives you link outs to all of these databases where your search term is found. The NCBI search can be a little bit tricky to start off with eh, but there are basic search options uh, like boolean operator so you can say well give me all publications by the author Denny and Arends, eh? because if you would just say Denny Arends, then eh, both terms are used uh, independently. So if you want to 
kind of merge two things together using Boolean operators. Hey, you can use things like and, or, and not, hey, and, and you can use parentheses to change the priority. Hey, so I, for example, want uh, everything known about the DGAT1 gene and the paper should mention Bos Taurus or Bos Indicus, right? So you, hey, the, the and is, is um, transitive hey, and based on the brackets you can kind of do your um, you can do your queries. Hey, the default is to search in all fields, which is generally not what you want. Hey, you can you can specify. Uh, hey, you can click on the advanced search option, and then you have a, a, a search builder, hey, which allows you to very specifically query several columns in their database. Hey, so you can say the author needs to be Denny Arons. Hey, the the, the uh, abstract of the paper should contain the word DGOT1. Um, hey, the, the conclusions or results should contain this sentence or this, uh, this uh, section. Hey, you can search by date range, which is also really handy because often hey, when you are writing a publication you want to know hey, what is recent and what has been known for a long time. Hey, so for example, if I, if I want to know hey, what was published about the DGAT1 gene in cow, so in Bos Taurus, and was published between 1st of January 2008 and the 10th month of 2011, and then you can just specify the date range, and you can use these square brackets to also specify in which column of the database you want to search. And so this only searches in publication date, and so this, this third term is not searched in the abstract. So if the abstract mentions 2011, then it then it will not find it because it will only show you publications which have been uh, published in that date range. Um, and so it is uh, you can you can have pre-selected searches and, and there's a popular search limit. Uh, but there's also things like has special cases like the author names or the database IDs that you can search in. And you can use wildcards and query truncation, which is also really handy uh, because you can, for example, say show me everything which is known about DGAT1 and Boss Star and the Bos star needs to be searched in the organism field, right? So this matches things like Bos taurus, Bos indicus, um, and all of the other more or less cow species which are out there. And so it will also match uh, Bos uh, bos, uh, um, uh, 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 mus musculus or something. And so, but that's the that's the thing that you can do. And so NCBI, it is a very, very detailed query engine and um, there's actually like a very nice help file online which describes exactly how you are able to find the, the exact things that you are looking at, which is really, really good. So it has index fields, right? So um, hey, it, it provides faster, more comprehensive and flexible access, like hey, it thinks you can search by publication date, by organism, by gene name. Hey, and of course, this, this is very useful because you don't have to, hey, if you would just Google something, then Google doesn't really care if um, the name that you are searching for is an organism or if it's a publication date, hey, it will just search everywhere. Hey, but you can build very, very specific queries using NCBI and especially when you're doing literature research, right? And hey, you want to write a literature review and then of course the literature review is made much, much easier by just being able to query NCBI in a good way. And so you can query, then you get an overview and then you say, well, I, I only actually want papers which are based on cows or plants or fish um, and I only want to have gene, uh, this gene name needs to be in the database record. Um, and so and of course, hey, you can you can follow the help because they have um, if you go to NCBI, hey, they have the training and tutorial link on their homepage, and this will just bring you um, to how to properly use the query builder um, and also how you can do these queries not on the website but directly from things like R. So really, really useful, really good database to start your search for uh, for information. Um, NCBI is really nice because it also provides a lot of downloads. They have this uh, this download site, hey, so you can go to uh, download comprehensive data sets via FTP. So they have a FTP server where you can download stuff and you can download like whole 
genome annotations of all um, and so you can say give me all the the genes in mouse and so it has a bulk query retrieval system and so if you don't want to go via an API you can also just do a batch query retrieval um, via FTP um, which is really nice and really useful all right, so Ensemble is very similar to NCBI. It's a genome browser, or at least it was. It started as a genome browser, um, and but it supports a lot of things. Hey, you can do comparative genomics. You can look at the evolutionary tree of proteins, or the evolutionary tree of things like mRNAs or or uh, link RNAs, hey, and and you can also look at sequence variation, like we did today, hey, by looking at SNPs in a certain gene. Um, and it also has linkouts to things like transcriptional regulation. So hey, if you want to know um, which promoter enhancers uh, suppressors are regulating the expression of this gene and then you can all find this in ensemble on the gene page and it has link outs to to other databases um, but also on on its own database so head ensemble annotates genes you can use it to compute multiple alignments and so to do multiple sequence alignments you can do uh, regular or uh, you can predict regulatory function of certain parts of the DNA head so does this DNA sequence uh, have the ability to bind a certain protein. Um, it collects disease data, so hey, once there is an association in the database saying that the BRCA2 gene causes breast cancer, hey, then that, that you can also display this information on top of the genome and see which regions of the genome are associated with which phenotypes. Um, and it provides things like BLAST and BLOT and Biomart um, and the thing that I find really really useful in Ensemble is the variant effect predictor. So often um, you are dealing with um, single mut mutations or like larger mutations in the genome and you want to know what the effect of this mutation is on the protein structure or on the protein expression. Um, so the variant effect predictor allows you to fill in the mutation or the um, the variant that you found and then it will predict the effect of this variant on protein structure and it will also tell you if this variant is deleterious or if it's accepted hey, or if it will change like the uh, the binding site and so it is a very good starting point to look at very different specific variants that you have and of course the main selling point for Ensemble is, is that it's connected to all kinds of different databases. Um, has so if it's not in the Ensemble database then they provide a link uh, where you can find your data or where you can read more. And of course it's also integrated with PubMed so had, you can also find out if you find a variant which is, you think is very interesting then you can read all about this variant in literature by just clicking a single link and then it will bring you to, uh, to PubMed and show you the literature which is associated with these variants. One of the things which is really nice and it's not not so important for this course right because it's bioinformatics of plant and animal sciences but Ensemble is also the home of the ENCODE project so the ENCODE project is one of these massively expensive projects um, which is on par with the human genome project right the human genome project is considered one of the great achievements of, of our our time and that we sequence the whole human genome the ENCODE project is even better because the ENCODE project is uh, is is a, is a project which was done by multiple international collaborators and their goal is to build a comprehensive list of all functional parts in the human genome right um, like when when people talked about DNA like five or ten years ago and they would talk about things like junk DNA, right? DNA which does not do anything and just is there. Hey, but what the ENCODE project did is use all kinds of very expensive techniques um, hey, which normal research group don't have access to and what they did is they just took samples from humans and applied all of these novel techniques like um, DNAs1 and, and doing methylation studies and they, 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 um, they went through the human genome and try to find what every little part of the human genome did. And so they have a list of all functional elements in the genome and including elements that act at the protein and RNA level and all regulatory elements that control cells and which circumstances a cell is active. And so if you want to know um, is this part of the DNA 
in responsible in humans yeah, because it's only focused on humans yeah, but does this have an effect on for example the expression of another gene yeah, does it have an effect on metabolites then the ENCODE project is your go-to place not only that but the ENCODE project itself is very um, is, is in a way is kind of the starting point for all other groups in the world like working on mice or working on plants or working on fish and what they do is they they, they kind of link their data um, to the ENCODE project and so the ENCODE project um, gives you uh, the ability to use the variant effect predictor and most of the data or the predictions from the variant effect predictor are based on data which was gathered by the ENCODE project and, but and they also look at methylation of DNA and all of these other things um, had to see, um, for example, if this Hox gene is expressed and what happens with this cell. And does it, for example, divide or and does it does it differentiate? And so all of these questions can be answered. Um, and it's 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 one of these projects which is just as big as the Human Genome Project, but many people don't know about it. Even in biology, it's a relatively well, not relatively unknown, and because many people do know that it exists but it is a, a, a an encyclopedia which contains information of all DNA elements um, that's where the name stands for so the ENCODE project has produced genome-wide data for over 100 different cell types for investigating different aspects of genome regulation. So like I told you, they did, they, they did chromatin structure, so 5C or high C. And they, they looked at uh, open and closed chromatin, so where is the DNA accessible within a certain cell type. And so if you want to know if a certain cell type, like um, red blood cells, and, uh, well, red blood cells are bad example because they don't have DNA um, yeah, but if you're interested in neutrophils or you're interested in granulocytes yeah, then you can see well what part of the DNA can granulocytes in theory use to express proteins from right um, they look at histone modifications and yeah, they have DNA binding of over a hundred transcription factors done by chip sec experiments over a hundred different cell types yeah, so there's like many many data points in there and they looked at RNA transcription using RNA sec and cage and so there's a lot of information there which is very very expensive information for an individual group to obtain um, but which they provide freely um, in the hopes that this encyclopedia will be useful in um, figuring out how to deal with cancer or how to deal with other um, um, diseases and help people that are working on these diseases. The DB SNP, we've been talking about the SNPs a lot and SNPs are kind of the main variants which we can observe and easily measure um, and the DB SNP is, it provides information on single nucleotide polymorphism. So if you find a new SNP, for example in mice, um, then um, you can go well, not to the dbSNP because you found it in mouse, but the dbSNP is kind of the original database. They used to store up until 2019 any species, um, but then at a certain point they decided, well, the data is becoming too big, so we will focus only on humans. Yeah, but uh, dbSNP contains human single nucleotide variants, they contain microsatellites, small scale insertions, deletions in the genome, and they have links to the population to the publications in which these were found. Uh, not only that, but they, they look at population frequencies, right? So you can see that, oh, this SNP is, is very commonly found in African Americans, but it's rarely found in Asians or in, in, in people from European descent. Um, had they look at molecular consequences of these SNP, and had they do uh, and genomic and uh, reference, seq reference seq mapping information for both common variants and clinical mutations. Uh, the DB SNP, um, so hey, when you read about SNPs in publication, um, they usually have an RS ID, which means that this is a reference SNP. Um, if you are working in other species um, since 2018, um, you can submit your data or you can retrieve your data from the European Variation Archive. Hey, so the, the, the animal data was more or less move from DB SNP to the EVA. Um, so the EVA holds the information on, on SNPs in cows and plants and fish. Um, SNPs in publications are usually referred to by their RS ID and of course have when you when you do things like sequencing um, and you find new SNPs in your um, your species of interest, and then journals require you to submit your data to 
the EVA if you're working on plants or to the DB SNP if you're working on humans because they won't accept um, a publication where you just mentioned that well we found this SNP at chromosome 6 at 53,000 million base pair eh, this position and this is the SNP and then the journal will say no no before you can publish your publication we we require you to put your data either in the DB SNP or in EVA and then you will get a, an RSID and this RSID when the genome build gets update in or gets updated like in one or two two months or in a year and then these reference SNPs will be remapped and so that it's clear where they exactly are located and what their effect is and how this SNP is distributed in different populations. The PDB protein database um, contains information about protein structure and function and um, the nice thing about the PDB is, is that they provide several visualizations. Um, so the three main visualizations that they provide to look at the 3D structure of proteins are the NGL, um, which is a fast and interactive web-based tool. Um, they provide JSMOL, which is a JavaScript version, and they use PV, um, which is the new kind of viewer which uses WebGL to uh, allow uh, hardware accelerated graphics and modern web and, and mobile browsers but had they the PDB the protein database it contains like a lot of information about proteins but their main focus is on the structure of proteins so hey if you want to look at how the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein looks um, then you can use the PDB uh, the PDB also allows you to do predictions right so you can say what happens if in the spike protein these five molecules are deleted and what does that do for the structure and then they provide these tools to do the visualization of them. And so PDB also provides a lot of additional tools like sequence and structure alignment and so you can do like pairwise sequel, uh, sequence alignment using BLAST or Needleman Wunsch or Smith Waterman algorithms um, but you can also do structural alignments and uh, where you say align this structure and search at the don't look at the amino acids and don't match the amino acids one by one and but um, search for structure and so find proteins which look very similar to mine and so they have an alpha helix and, and a beta sheet um, and they also allow you to look at protein symmetry which is uh, a relatively new field of research where it, it turns out that symmetry in protein is, is very important um, and so uh, if a protein is not symmetrical um, or in many cases hey if there's no symmetry in for example the the, the cell wall pore that you have and then of course this this has an influence um, and they also have a good database on protein structure quality and so um, I think we talked about the new Google deep learning algorithm and that of course had that that uses the PDB um, to see if their predictions are matching the quality of the of the protein structure. So have protein structure quality and how well are have we been able to um, kind of look at these um, uh, proteins and uh, how much um, uncertainty is still there. And that is also something that you can get for PDB. So the protein sequence database um, is actually uh, and so um, this is this is not the PDB which is a protein which is the protein database you also have the protein sequence database which is called Uniprot so Uniprot is, is one of these databases where it's all about sequence right not about structure so PDB is really about structure but Uniprot um, is more about um, sequence and Uniprot actually is uh, is just the entry point like it's the web server and it contains two beta databases in the in the back end one of them is called Swissprot and the other one is called Tremble um, so when we look at Swissprot um, it looks a little bit like this um, but it is a manually annotated manually reviewed database so hey, it is kind of of the highest quality like we said and manual curation is the thing that is that is most important because that that just increases the quality of data that you get and so here you see the amount of entries in the database so you see that between 2000 and 2010 there was a massive increase in um, protein uh, protein uh, sequences which have been produced um, and the 2019 release actually had uh, 561 uh, thousand protein entries it is updated every month um, hey, but you see that after like 2010 the amount of new proteins coming in is relatively low 
Uh, because here, of course, because they are looking at sequence, but once you have discovered, um, uh, once the discovery of the of, of DNA and how it encodes, uh, so then there was a big discovery jump. Uh, but from 2010, the database is relatively stable and it doesn't add that many new proteins every time. Uh, it has, again, many tools integrated, um, and like BLAST and pairwise search and batch download. Um, uh, the other side, yeah, so this is one of the sides of the Uniprot database. Um, the other side is the Tremble database, and the Tremble database is um, is is based on DNA sequence. It's a protein database which is based on DNA sequence. Um, and what what they did is they use a computer to translate uh, coding sequences. So yeah, they look at a gene, they take the coding sequence from a gene, and then they use a computer annotation to, to translate these coding sequences into protein sequences. The problem here is that this is one of these kind of low quality databases in a way. Right, because it is computer annotated, there's not a person looking at it. Um, it also has monthly updates, um, and in 2019, you can see that there's like a massive more amount of protein sequences stored in this database. Yeah, but you can also see here this big, big kind of um, kind of fall in the amount of sequences, and this is because they figured out that their their computer annotation actually contained a bug. So have in this in 2015 they actually had to remove uh, or more or less manually remove like uh, around 40 million uh, sequences from the database which the computer predicted well these are protein sequences but they actually turned out to not be protein sequences so and this is one of these risks of using computer annotated data hey, is that when a computer annotates the data and the computer makes a mistake, then this mistake is very significant, right? Because a lot of people hey, were trusting the predictions done by Tremble, and because they trusted the predictions done by Tremble, they thought like, oh, so this part of the genome codes for a certain protein, and then like a month later, they cleaned up the database and said, well, we made a horrible mistake, and, and there were like a lot of sequences in there uh, which were not real, so. Um, and that's one of these risks. Yeah, so if you if you find your protein in Swissprot, yeah, then always use the Swissprot data and never use the Tremble data unless you are working on a protein uh, which is not found in the Swissprot database yeah, but is predicted by the Tremble computer annotation. All right, I think we should take a very short break. Um, I've been talking now again for around 40 minutes. Um, let me stop the recording. <laughs>